Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming back after break. I'm here to talk about neuromorphic chips. So I direct the Integrated Nano Computing Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. It is a about 20-person group that includes PhD students, postdocs, and undergraduates. And we are interested in how we can take new physics and new materials and see the benefits of those physics and materials in new unconventional computing applications. We are in a new computing era of artificial intelligence, where we have deep neural networks and um, advanced technologies that can change how computing is done today. In neuromorphic computing, we change the building blocks of computers. Instead of using logic devices and memory devices, now we have neurons and synapses that we use to encode our information. And just like with our traditional devices, these artificial neurons need to have certain properties for them to work in neuromorphic computers. They should take in signals, have an activation function, and have some kind of firing prop property. And artificial synapses should encode the connections between neurons. So this is often done by encoding the resistance between these neurons. It's going to tell us how um, connected or less connected they are. So neuromorphic computing has already seen great impact using uh, traditional CMOS materials and silicon-based technologies. Some examples are IBM True North and Intel Luigi, which is being um, utilized throughout the globe. At the same time, AI faces clear challenges. It lacks advanced cognition. It is not innately context-aware. And it takes a lot of energy for both training these neural networks and then deploying them and using them in tasks such as inference. So as we look to the future and the next generation of AI, we can take further inspiration from our brains. And there are two, two, two key questions that then arise. What is the origin of more advanced cognition in the brain? And then how can we utilize and um, take that information um, to, to create advanced cognition using our new materials? As we look to answer this question, we have to start thinking about application-specific devices and devices that can be adapted um, dynamically to different applications. So two classic applications I want to talk about today. One is inference. That's where we train our neural network. And then we have it do something like recognize these images. Um, in that case, we want our synapses to take one of those two device types to be what's called linear and symmetric. We want them to respond linearly to inputs that set that weight, and we want it to respond the same, respond the same to both positive and negative updates to that resistance of that synapse. For online learning, this is a different application where instead of training and then using our neural networks, we want them to be able to learn as they're in their environment. And here, there are different requirements for our fundamental building blocks. For example, our synapses, we want them to, as they get trained on new data, not forget what they previously learned. And that is a big challenge today in current neural networks. So where do new materials come in? Uh, there are two main ma material classes that we are focused on in my research group. The first are magnetic materials. And this is a little hard to see, but it's actual data of um, a magnetic contrast image of uh, magnetic material switching with field. So the, the dark and the light are opposite magnetized magnetic domains. And these materials are um, very energy efficient in how we switch them with currents. They also are compatible with CMOS silicon technologies. So we can imagine using these materials and then connecting them directly to existing computers today. They also are very hardened against radiation, which makes them a very exciting material for space applications. And most importantly, they have dynamical behaviors, such as domain walls, spin textures, and frequency-based behaviors that we can harness for computing. The other main class of materials that I'm very excited about for neuromorphic computing are 2D materials. So these materials are naturally scaled. They're atomically thin. Um, the most commonly known one is graphene, but there's a huge library of these materials. Uh, they also can have very interesting physical effects that arise from the confinements of electrons in this 2D plane, and also from layering them precisely together to create unique functions. 
so want to dive a little bit deeper into magnetic devices, uh, one of the device types we explore is called the domain wall magnetic tunnel junction. So it's shown in a cartoon here, and here is one fabricated in my group using um, lithography techniques. And essentially, it's a magnetic domain wall. That's this white um, line here that we can push back and forth electrically between another magnet. And using that, we can control the resistance of the entire device to make it act like a synapse. And so we can do this electrically. Here is a, um, a movie showing optically how these domains can be moved and propagated across a larger device that we can uh, image optically. So the black is uh, uh, magnetized up, white is magnetized down as it moves across these wires. So we can make these into synapses. Um, so this is the device made in my lab. And over here is data showing that we can get five different resistance states um, that are very stable at room temperature. And these can be used as artificial synapses. So we can take that data and we can put it into, for example, that inference application that I'm, that I'm interested in. And we can look at, for example, how accurate it is, it is at recognizing this particular data set versus different notches we can put into our devices of different uh, levels of our resistance states. And we can see that the orange curve here of our measured devices is um, ideal compared to the ideal um, accuracy of this task. And so this um, impresses on us the ability of these magnetic devices to be um, very uh, useful devices for inference applications. I'm going to skip this. This is just showing more of this desired properties we want for these devices of the linearity and symmetry. So that's inference. Let's go back to the other task, online learning. And here, we want our devices to not have catastrophic forgetting. And so we implement this by changing just the geometry of our track. Everything else is the same. And now, here's the data. It behaves quite differently, where we get this nonlinear but very controllable behavior of our resistance levels. And so again, we can put this into a neural network accelerator on an online learning task now. And we can see over here our green trapezoidal device um, it has much higher accuracy over much quicker learning than our linear devices or, or a, a CMOS-based neural network. We can also then play around with things like using this um, asymmetry in our devices, we can reduce the size from having to have 32 resistances down to just four and obtain the same accuracy. So by playing with these metaplastic properties of our synapses inspired by the brain, we can then achieve much better neuromorphic computing for specific applications. So just to end my talk, well, that, those devices, those magnetic devices, can connect to, to silicon. But what if we want to connect to biology? And that's where graphene comes in, because it is fully biocompatible. And so here is um, a graphene synapse device that we um, developed in our lab. As you can see, it's flexible and it's transparent. And here, um, we utilize this great property of 2D materials that they are very flat and therefore very responsive to anything you put on their surface. So here we're putting um, protons, moving protons on the surface of this graphene, and then we can get these different conductance states that act as our synapse. And one thing we've shown with these new devices is their extreme energy efficiency. So here's energy dissipation um, versus speed versus other device types out there in the same family. And our red stars here were in this very highly energy efficient region, which is very exciting for more green electronics. And just like we saw with the magnetic devices, these 2D devices also have these um, higher order effects that we can use to more efficiently do neural network um, operations. So to conclude, uh, I'm very excited about how we can take neuroscience-inspired effects see how they can be inherent in our new materials, and then look at what the system level benefits of changing our fundamental building blocks can be. And this is a wide open field that I encourage you to um, talk to me more about and, and learn about. Thank you.